All right, welcome everyone. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about uh, disease mapping. So we are here in the second uh, lecture of the population genetics and disease genomics module. We've talked about um, a lot of the circuitry of uh, genomics. And then we saw how genetic variation is at the foundation of phenotypic variability. But we've primarily focused on the variation itself in genetics. Today, we're going to be focusing on the variation in function and how that relates to variation in genetics. And then next uh, two lectures are going to be about quantitative trait mapping and then systems uh, genomics. So that's the, you know, here's the, here's the main goal of today's lecture. Today's lecture is how do we understand how genetic variation relates to disease? So I showed you a, a slide very similar to this one in one of the first uh, lectures, and that was the yeast genome. This slide is actually my genome. <laughs> this is a uh, genetic variation in my own DNA. And uh, I specifically have three mutations, which are uh, the worst news about my genome. When I first got my 23andMe genetic variation mapping, uh, it came up with these three variations that somehow uh, were unfortunate. So what are they? They're basically three common variants that are associated with in increased risk of age-related macular degeneration. So that's a form of blindness that uh, causes you to lose the central part of your vision as you age. And uh, I have three risk-inducing alleles in these uh, five loci. Uh, and that increases my risk from, you know, 6% to about 8%. So it's not enormous, but it's still, you know, the worst news about my genome. And that's what I got from 23andMe. And when I actually went and looked at the genome-wide association for age-related macular degeneration, sure enough, the same genes that were in my disease report we're up here reigning supreme as the strongest genetic associations with AMD. So the big question, of course, is how do the, you know, how do those function? What do those mutations actually do? And they're actually located in uh, three different parts of the genome. Two of them are disrupting the proteins. So they're actually changing an amino acid. And one of them is in this known coding region uh, near the SYN3 gene and the TIMP3 gene. And if you look specifically at these locus, these are actually sitting upstream of TIMP3 and then inside SYN3. And the question, of course, is, you know, what do they do? And can I do anything about it? Basically, can we learn something about the disease by looking at this genetic variation? So, in the beginning of the module, we saw how we can catalog all genetic variants in the human genome, how we can catalog all SNPs systematically or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Today, we're going to look at how do we systematically associate them with disease, and also how do we use genome-wide association studies to understand disease mechanism and function, and lastly, how do we translate these insights into therapeutics and manipulation. So, how do we systematically understand the molecular basis of human disease? So that's the, the goal for today. So how do we go beyond just genetic variation to phenotypic variation and how we can relate the two to each other? So uh, we're going to first talk about Mendelian traits and linkage as the workhorse of Mendelian genetics for building genetic maps and using family studies to find map variants. And then we're going to switch to modern genetics, if you wish, with complex traits and extreme polygenicity, contributions by the environment and continuous variables. Then we're gonna dive into the you know, mechanistics of how do we actually carry out a genome-wide association study. And we're gonna talk about study design, QC, the chi-square test, how to correct for multiple hypothesis testing, replication, and then QQ plots. And then we're gonna talk about uh, fine mapping and then the differences of uh, the results that we have from linkage versus association, and in what regimes does each method work best between this Mendelian approach and this genome-wide approach, and then how we can combine multiple studies. And then we're gonna switch to interpretation and function 
how do we in understand individual loci and how do we exploit genomic signals and we're going to look at different case studies on translating genetic loci into mechanism what are the tools that we can use and then case studies from the roadmap and epimap uh, papers and then from the fto paper and um, then we're going to look at the systems level views for all this. And then um, I'm guessing time won't permit, but if time permits, we're going to get it into next gen. Okay. So let's start with genetics. So uh, when you think genetics, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously Gregor Mendel. And that's sort of the, that's been the traditional view of genetics for about 150 years. And for the last 10 years, genetics has really become about genome wide association studies. And now it's becoming more about whole genome sequencing and exome and so on and so forth. So what does Mendelian genetics allow you to do? What Mendelian genetics allows you to do is recognize that there are discrete units of inheritance and that variation in these units is transmissible and resulted in phenotypic differences. It's this whole separation between the genotype, namely what I have inside my germline and the phenotype, namely whatever that genotype encodes as visible phenotypes. And this whole point of Mendelian genetics is that you could look at dominance versus recessivity, so capital letters versus lowercase letters, and how each of those can basically lead to whether you have you know, any of these uh, dominant yellow uh, genes, then you're yellow. But if you have two recessive yellow genes, then you're not yellow. And then this uh, wrinkled uh, phenotype, where basically, if you, uh, you know, if you have a specific combination, then that uh, expresses itself. So basically what Mendel was finding is this very weird uh, count of numbers. When he was looking at this, he was basically finding that he had um, this combination. You can think of these little square, squares with yellow, yellow, green, yellow, yellow, green, yellow, yellow, green, yellow, yellow, green, and these big squares with, um, you know, round, 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 wrinkled. So basically in the big square. So this is basically the juxtaposition of two dominant and two recessive, um, you know, alleles uh, interacting with each other. So he found this 9331, which again makes no sense until you see it over and over and over again. And until you have the mathematical clean, uh, you know, clarity of mind that Mendel had to basically come up with a concept of dominance versus recessivity and independent assortment of different uh, traits. Okay. So that's basically, you know, basic high school genetics. And it's a little bit of a review of what we talked about last time. So, of course, the, the first challenge that, uh, you know, um, Mendel was faced with was the concept of linkage, that some pairs of phenotypes were not quite passed on independently. And that violated Mendel's second rule of independent assortment. And the reason why this was happening is because they were actually not far enough from each other in uh, the chromosome. And he had a sufficiently, uh, you know, sufficiently abundant data to be able to detect it and to notice it that in fact, there were some deviations. And the concept of linkage is that genes on the same physical chromosome are passed along in tandem unless there's a meiotic crossover that occurs. And we talked about PRDM9 and crossovers and sort of these hotspots of recombination last time. So here the genes of interest are separated by three centimorgan, which indicates about a 3% chance of recombination during meiosis. Okay, So basically the 3% deviation from what you would have expected of 50-50-0-0 is in fact, um, you know, because of that um, linkage. So linkage was basically a bug and Mendel didn't really like that. But in fact, linkage became the workhorse of Mendelian genetics. When uh, Sturtevant, basically the student of Morgan, suddenly realized that the variation in strength of linkage already attributed by Morgan to differences in the spatial separation of genes offered the possibility of determining sequences in the linear dimension of a chromosome. So the student, Alfred Sturtevant, went home as an undergrad and spent most of the night, to the neglect of his undergrad homework, producing the first chromosome map. 
which included sex-linked genes, Y, W, V, M, R, and R, in the order and approximately the same relative spacing that they still appear on the standard maps. This is remarkable, right? To basically be working with your Europe project and then uh, just revolutionize genetics uh, in passing. So that basically became the Mendelian way of solving disease. Mendelian diseases were basically traveling in predictable and consistent ways within families. For example, you could look at a dominant transmission where basically whoever gets the capital A or the lowercase a, for example, has the disease. And that's a dominant phenotype. Basically, it only takes one copy to express the phenotype. So you don't have to have you know, a lot of children for that phenotype to express. Half the children will have it. And there's thousands of diseases or traits that are caused by mutations in a single gene. So we talked about Huntington's, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy is another example. And then family-based linkage study was basically saying that if I have polymorphisms that I have already mapped, such as markers along the body of the chromosome that I, I know how to map, and I have disease genes that are co-inherited with those, then I can use that as a way to infer the physical distance along the chromosome, or I should say the genetic distance, which is some approximation of the physical distance. It depends on how many crossovers do you have per unit of distance to track the co-segregation of DNA polymorphisms with disease status, allowing the identification of the regions containing the responsible genes and mutations. Okay. So this allowed you to say, aha, I have now a co-inheritance of this marker with my disease gene. And that allows me to now start mapping disease genes near markers. And that basically saw dramatic successes in the 80s and 90s for the localization of genes underlying countless Mendelian disorders. And again, there are many of those. As soon as the sound gets weird, just like wave and let me know because uh, I can switch microphones. Can you guys still hear me well? Yeah. All right. So the, the concept of Mendelian genetics was that we were able to associate genetic variation with disease variation, that linkage analysis and positional cloning, which basically means figuring out where along the body of the chromosome, the physical embodiment of this concept of genetic variation, this physical embodiment basically uh, allowed positional cloning and that allows genetic factors to be mapped when they were highly penetrant. The problem is that most complex traits are not based on highly penetrant variation. Many complex traits are extremely polygenic with tiny, tiny effect sizes and this continuous variation uh, along the, the genome. So if you look at the number of human Mendelian traits that were mapped in the 80s and 90s, you see this tremendous success with, you know, 1,800 different traits mapped, different loci mapped. That's enormous. By contrast, this blue curve of human complex traits was in the single digits uh, for a while, basically. So with human complex traits, you basically had less than 10 genome-wide significant hits. So this is, you know, a, a problem basically. And even in, you know, other uh, complex traits that are not human, uh, there were just very, very few examples. So <coughs> the first such example was uh, in the genetic basis of truncate wing in Drosophila, where you could actually see that there are multiple um, contributors to that. And with traits like genetic, like uh, height, which are extremely genetically heritable, we basically come to realize that there are thousands of genetic variants, each contributing less than a millimeter to your height. So the concept is that there's genotypic variation that contributes to phenotype, but there's also many, many other genes, each contributing to many, many phenotypes. And these intermediate phenotypes basically combine with each other to ultimately alter disease state which is not purely genetically driven, but is also associated with environmental exposures. And some of those uh, exposures are affecting other genes, which are then affecting, you know, these phenotypes as well. So this whole concept 
that uh, polygenic variation drives um, this disease state and that this polygenic variation is not just sitting in protein coding regions, but is in fact outside the protein coding genes in the control regions was already proposed by King and Wilson back in 1975, suggesting that evolutionary changes in anatomy and way of life are more often based on changes in the mechanisms controlling the expression of genes than on sequence changes in proteins. We therefore propose that regulatory mutations account for the major biological differences between humans and chimps. So that was dramatically early, so 1975. This was not truly embraced by the rest of the scientific community for many decades uh, after that. And again, I mentioned how Ronald Fisher in 1918 basically <clears throat> wrote a seminal paper talking about the correlation between relatives on the supposition of Mendelian inheritance. This whole concept that many Mendelian traits can sum to a continuous distribution. So with complex traits, instead of one gene determining the G's or trait, there's many genes, each exerting a small influence. None by themselves can cause or explain the disease of the trait fully, but together with environmental influences that combine to define an individual outcome. And most common diseases, in fact, work this way. So that's where you know, we were, and that's how things dramatically changed with genome-wide association studies. So here we are in the early 2000s, the human genome has just been finished, the initial draft in 99, the final sequence in 2003. So we are just at the beginning of having a complete genome and we can now enter the era of genome-wide association studies. So there's three major elements that turn the tide. The first is genomic resources, the second is technology, and the third one is collaboration. So the sequencing of the human genome was a major such resource. The second one is the understanding of the catalog and variation in the genome, that's HapMap and Thousand Genomes Project, which we talked about uh, last time. And then the technological uh, innovation was basically these microarrays, this ability to measure thousands upon thousands of variants at the same time. Instead of cloning, instead of genotyping one variant at a time or a handful of variants, you could now genotype all of common variation. Now it's commonplace to have millions of SNPs in the same array that allows you for you know, uh, very little cost to profile nearly all of the common variation in a person. And we are now also in the era of sequencing an entire human genome for less than $1,000, which is you know, very often offered by uh, many companies already. So you could now compare the genomes of hundreds of thousands of cases and controls for genetic variants that are um, underlying slight statistical differences between the two groups, between the carriers and the non-carriers. So there's tiny, tiny effects, tiny uh, differences, but then extremely robust. And then the third thing that turned the tide is, of course, collaboration. So basically, if you look at the International uh, Inflammatory Bowel Disease Genetics Consortium, you see sites across many, many different uh, locations. So now we have the ability to measure variation across millions of SNPs in the genome. We have the ability to impute missing SNPs, as we saw last time, using linkage to equilibrium and using uh, haplotype inference and then painting of these haplotypes on top of the genetic variation we can now start asking, how do you carry out a genome-wide association study? So there's a lot of qual quality control metrics that one needs to do. There's a technical QC step where you remove failed SNPs and samples. There's a genetic QC step where you basically ask, is there Mendelian segregation and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Can you estimate relatedness between individuals? Are there gender effects? Is there a hidden population structure where you know the ethnic background or the, uh, you know, geographic background of that population is in fact explaining a lot of that variation. So controlling for these uh, global effects. And some of that can be done through principal component analysis as we talked about last time, where you can basically take the individual by genotype matrix and then decompose it, partition it into uh, these principal components and then remove some of those strongest components that are usually associated with population structure. And then 
there's an analysis base you see of whether initial rounds of test statistics show inflation and whether there's biases towards missing data or specific allele frequencies and so on and so forth. And after you've done all that, you basically have your genome-wide association statistics. And you can ask for every single SNP in the genome, carry out the same exact statistical test. So what you're asking is how many individuals who are cases carry the A allele or the G allele at every locus versus how many individuals who are controls. And by expectation, you would expect this ratio to be the same by chance. So you would expect 47 A alleles and 47 uh, in, in controls and 47 A alleles in cases compared to 950 G alleles in both cases and controls. But what you're observing is instead of these 47, 47, you see this over-representation of um, allele A in your cases and this under-representation of allele A in your controls. Sorry, this under-representation of A and this over-representation of A in the controls, okay? So you're deviating from what you would have expected. And of course, the question is, is this statistically significant? So you can ask, what is the observed minus expected squared divided by expected? And that's basically a chi-squared test. So this is the simplest statistical test you can imagine to basically see if in a two, you know, by two contingency table, there's deviation from that expectation. So this is the observed minus expected squared divided by E for, you know, each of the quadrants. And then together that gives you a chi-square score of 24.5. And then you can look at, based on the degrees of freedom, how far down that um, curve does 24.5 take you? And it takes you at 7.3 times 10 to minus 7. Okay. So basically, genetic association results require very arcane statistics, and complex multi market models are very often less reliable. So they've been shied away from by the statistical geneticists. So, who's with me so far on sort of carrying out this? genome-wide association study. So you basically take every SNP in the genome and then you ask what is the frequency of the reference versus the alternate allele for every single SNP and whether that frequency deviates from what you would have expected under a random model. So we're at 75, 25, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so there's a problem, however. I don't know if you've seen this XKCD cartoon where they basically go and, uh, and say, oh, um, uh, XKCD, multiple hypothesis testing. There you go. So um, OK. Um, jelly beans cause acne. Scientists, investigate. But we're playing Minecraft. Fine. We found no link between jelly beans and acne. It's not significant. That settles that. I hear it's only a certain color that causes it. Scientists, investigate. We found no link between purple jelly beans and acne. No link between brown jelly beans and acne. No link between pink jelly beans and acne. No link between blue jelly beans and acne. And they keep going on and on and on and on until one of them, we found a link between green jelly beans and acne. Whoa. News, green jelly beans linked to acne, 95% confidence, only 5% chance of coincidence. So what's going on here? They basically tested 20 different colors and one of them was significant with only one chance out of 20 of coming up significant. So <laughs> what's actually happening is multiple hypothesis uh, inflation. So you're basically testing a lot of hypotheses, each of which has the same chance of being wrong and one of them, by chance, is going to be wrong. Uh, so um, we did the green study again, and no link. It was probably uh, researchers conflicted on jelly beans versus acne link. More study recommended. Anyway, so I don't know if you guys have seen this cartoon before, but this is the problem that we're facing. Basically, if you find an association with 10 to the minus 5, and you're like, woohoo, this is great, but you've done a million tests. So the field of GWAS was uh, earning itself a bad name early on because people were doing this statistical test and they were like testing 20 loci uh, 
in their favorite genes and then reporting a significant association for those 20 and then they were super happy. But then the problem is that these studies would not replicate. And there's a phenomenon known as, uh, you know, uh, winner's curse. And this, call, this, this, this problem that if you barely pass genome-wide significance, but then you test again, again, and again, chances are that you're gonna actually go below genome-wide significance. And the reason for this is that there's an ascertainment bias. Basically, if you win, if you just pass the threshold, and there's an underlying distribution, which is basically looking like this. Um, and you're not going to get excited if you, you know, and, and you have this distribution for many, many loci. You're not going to get excited for all the ones that just don't pass the significant threshold. But if one of them passes it, you're going to be like, whoa, this is awesome. I just passed the 5% significant threshold. The problem is that there's an underlying true effect size. And then there's some statistical fluctuation surrounding this true effect size. And as you sample different subsets of, let's say, 100 individuals, 100 cases and 100 controls, in your sample, the effect size might be distributed around the true effect size beta. So if the true effect size beta is here, the observed effect size beta prime that you have in any one particular sample will deviate around that true beta. And if you have a stringent threshold that you've just picked, you know, that, that sort of just barely crosses that threshold, you run the risk of having sampled something from the right end of that distribution. And if you choose another sample, it will just randomly come up from the left side of that distribution. Who's with me so far on this um, winner's curse uh, with statistics and random sampling? Awesome. So basically what this is telling you, and, and this is what underlies, for example, fighter jet pilots who perform really, really well, would receive an award, and then on their next dogfight, they would basically uh, perform worse. So the army said, oh no, we should, we should stop rewarding them because that changes their performance. But in fact, what was happening is that they were simply regressing to the mean. You know, the next time they were more likely to be another independent sample from that distribution. And some days the pilots would perform slightly worse than usual. And some days they would perform slightly better than usual. If you pick those slightly better and you follow them, if you pick the best performer and you follow them, chances are they're just gonna perform slightly worse uh, the next time around. All right, so uh, we're at 56, 38, 6, 0, 0. Okay, so we need to actually correct for multiple hypothesis testing. Green jelly beans don't cause acne. So we, um, if in linkage, you have about 50 different chromosomal arms that you're testing. So if you divide this 0.05 threshold of being wrong, roughly only one out of 20, you basically divide that by the 50 chromosomes, you get a p-value of 10 to the minus three that you need to meet in order to be statistically significant at 0.05 after correcting for the 50 independent hypotheses that you're testing. But with genome-wide association studies, we're actually performing a million different tests that are largely independent from each other, one in every LD block. Every study naturally has hundreds of 10 to the minus three p-values purely by statistical chance. There's no real relationship to the disease. It's just statistical fluke because you're testing millions of things. So that's where the concept of genome-wide significance came from. Basically, you know, folks agreed that we would now require a genome-wide significance threshold that would be very stringent. And if you didn't meet it, too bad. You have to get a bigger sample because you just might be suffering from winner's curse. So genome-wide significance was basically defined as five times 10 to minus eight, which is nothing more than 0.05, the same p-value that the jelly beans folks wanted, divided by a million different colors of jelly beans that you're testing. Everybody with me? So what that allows us to do is now uh, come up with a much more stringent test that every, everybody needs to pass. And that's what reversed this curse of GWAS where things would just not replicate. 
basically Rich and Mary Kangas proposed a p-value threshold of five times 10 to the minus eight, where they basically did a back of the envelope and they said, we probably have about a million independent tests. This is well, well before the HapMap project, well, well before uh, the Thousand Genomes project. So very early days. And they just said, oh, well, it's probably a million independent te tests. And then about uh, 12 years later, three different groups empirically derived estimates based on dense genome-wide maps of common DNA and estimated that the correction should be between 2.5 and 7.2 times 10 to the minus eight. So they were right with this ballpark 12 years ahead of their time. And that is still the threshold that people are using for GWAS. So here's the first GWAS for IBD. So, uh, you know, inflammatory bowel disease. You basically have no hits for most of the genome, except for a handful that, boom, pass this genome-wide significance uh, threshold. So there's NOG2 and ILR, uh, IL23R. And then there's some that are begging here to become significant and, um, you know, so on and so forth. And then IBD5, one of the well-known genes from linkage, was in fact nowhere near significant. So what do you do with this? And first of all, why are some of them recapitulated and some of them are not? So again, replication was key. So don't believe a report of association from a single study. Even with strict QC, there are artifacts that can affect one every thousand or every 10,000 SNPs and escape notice. So strict genome-wide significance generally is not dramatically, if it's not dramatically excluded, ex exceeded um, or reached at all in a single study, you need to basically repeat it in a new study to see which ones of those that are just barely reaching significance, if at all, uh, are in fact going to be replicated in a new study. So that's what uh, this, uh, these results represent. So basically, this is what we call a Manhattan plot. And the reason for that is that there's many, many tall houses, but there's a few super, super tall skyscrapers surrounding these houses. So um, if you look at the Manhattan skyline, this is basically what it looks like. So you have a few locations that are just the super, super tall skyscrapers. Every dot is a different SNP, a different single nucleotide polymorphism. Every X coordinate is the location on the chromosome. And the Y coordinate is the minus log 10 P value of the uh, genetic correlation. So the eight, the five times 10 to minus eight is you know, roughly uh, here. So basically just slightly be below 10 to minus eight. Okay. So this is basically the typical Manhattan plot that basically tells you where every SNP lies. And another uh, very helpful plot is looking at whether the expected chi-squared value matches the observed chi-squared value along the distribution here. So you can now ask, how are the rest of the SNPs distributed? Yes, those are off scale, but how are the rest of the SNPs distributed? And you can use this QQ plot to, to see whether these are distributed along expectation and whether they deviate early or not and what is that confidence interval around the null distribution? So that basically tells you that there's a large number of SNPs that are clearly deviating statistically, even though they might not reach genome-wide significance, uh, significance. And then of course, the next challenge is how do you go from a region of association to a SNP of association? And that's not always easy. So if I, for ILR, uh, IL23R, there's a clear SNP that is the strongest genetically, and that happens to be the protein coding changing SNP. But that's an exception. Most of the time, there is no clear winner. And most of the time, there is no protein coding variant. So you're going to have to figure out how to do the fine mapping. And we're going to talk about fine mapping approaches uh, shortly. So these are all of the SNPs in that region of association and then their specific locations with only one out of approximately a thousand bases, now more like 300 bases or less uh, of variation in the human genome. All of us have exactly the same sequence here, but many of us carry one of those common variants in a haplotype. And of course, in the background of all those common variants, there are additional 
population specific variants and family specific variants and de novo variants and even somatic variants that occur in the context of the scaphotypes. Who's with me so far? <clears throat> awesome, so 50, 40, 13. And then uh, how's the pace so far? Let's see. Oh, wow, cool. Just right, and a few folks, just a little too fast. OK, so, um, so that's statistical fine mapping. And there are many approaches for fine mapping. You can basically look at what is the, uh, so the peak SNP is the one that has the strongest p-value. And you could basically ask, well, what is the set, the credible interval set among all of the SNPs that I'm seeing, which ones are still credible? So you can do that by looking at what is the R squared this is exactly the linkage to equilibrium uh, metric that we talked about earlier. We talked about D and D prime and R squared in the last lecture. So you can ask, what is the R squared in this locus between the, each SNP and all of the other SNPs? So this is the genome-wide significant SNP. And then you can ask not what is the p-value of the other SNPs, because that p-value is of course inflated by the top SNP. If you are in a linkage to, in a strong linkage to equilibrium with the lead SNP, and the lead SNP is the only functional SNP, you will still have a very strong p-value just because you're tagging along. So the goal of fine mapping is to basically ask which of these SNPs are simply tagging along versus which ones are actually um, in the credible interval. So that's what these locus zoom uh, views uh, are looking at. So you can ask with different um, metrics, what, which of the SNPs are likely to still be real? So one metric is simply using the LD with a peak SNP. So at various thresholds of LD uh, R squared, you can basically paint the SNPs based on red, orange, green, and blue based on how far they are from in, in genetic space from the lead SNP. You could also look at a penalized regression. Basically, if I correct for the lead SNP, what is the residual beta for all of the SNPs that are nearby? And you can ask, what is that residual beta? And I can you know, infer that as a set of credible SNPs for all of the genetic variants that have a non-zero beta. You could also ask, if I um, sum all of the posterior uh, inclusion probability, so basically this is the probability that any one of those SNPs is actually important, what is that posterior inclusion probability? And then summing those to credible sets with some probability of coverage greater than 95, you will note that the peak SNP is not always the highest PIP. And the reason is that there's a correlation structure of the SNPs in the region that is actually driving up the score of the most linked SNP because of the linkage equilibrium properties. And if you correct for that linkage disequilibrium structure of that region of how every SNP is correlated with every other SNP, thereby boosting the signal of the top SNP, you might realize that in fact your most likely causal SNP is one that is actually not the top one because it has perhaps a lower association with all the other ones, causing it to be less inflated, but a higher posterior inclusion probability. You could also find map using trans-ethnic studies. So by looking at the association in an Asian sample or in an African ancestry sample or a European ancestry sample, you might actually have different LD structures within each of the populations. And when you combine the multiple populations, you might realize that, well, those two SNPs are the ones that are most likely to be causal, even though this one, for example, was not one of the top SNPs in the second population. So that's trans-ethnic fine mapping. And then a lot of the remaining of the lecture, we're going to be talking about multi-region fine mapping using specific annotations, 
and just to uh, spill the beans a little bit, if you have an annotation that's, you know, annotation two here, that's not found in the credible set here and is not found in the credible set here and is not found in the credible set there, you're likely going to say, well, annotation two is probably irrelevant to my trait. But if you look at annotation one, it overlaps the credible interval here and it also overlaps the incredible interval here. For example, with genetic variants associated with height, you might see that across 100 loci, embryonic stem cell enhancers keep being within the credible interval. So you might say, I'm going to now have a posterior probability, a prior that is higher when a SNP overlaps an embryonic stem cell enhancer for genetic variants associated with height. And therefore, if I see overlap in locus one and two, I might predict that the top posterior inclusion probability SNP in locus three is the one that specifically overlaps the annotation that locus one and locus two overlapped. And that also has a sufficient association to be in a credible set. So who's with me here on the different methods for uh, fine mapping? So we have just this, you know, everything within a certain LD threshold of R squared greater than something, anything that has a residual beta that's greater than zero, anything that has a posterior inclusion probability after correcting for the LD structure that's highest, a multi-ethnic study, which gives you a posterior probability combining the individual estimates, and an epigenomic or other kind of annotation-based uh, enrichment. Okay, so we're at 0, 50, 50, 0, 0. So going back to this association uh, result, we basically have uh, you know, several loci that are at or near genome-wide significance. The question is, were any of them also discovered by linkage analysis? And the answer is one of them was discovered by linkage analysis. Again, this is very clearly real. This is way above the genome-wide significance threshold. And that's also way above the genome-wide significance threshold. But this was actually not discovered by linkage. And the question is, what's going on? Why would linkage not find some of them and find other ones? And the reason is simply due to the frequency of the SNP and the odds ratio. This is the increased risk. This is increasing your risk by threefold. This is decreasing your risk by threefold. This is increasing your risk by only 40%. So if you can, you can calculate based on the frequency of those SNPs in the population and based on the odds ratio estimated from your sample where you, where you found them to be genome-wide significant, or whatever sample, even if they're not genome wide significant, you can basically ask how many cases would I need in an association study to achieve genome wide significance? And here you have, you know, in the order of hundreds of cases. But you can also ask how many linkage pedigrees do I need to achieve genome wide significance? And the ones that was previously discovered, the one that was previously discovered, not two only needs 1,400 pedigrees to be discovered. I mean, you know, that's still a lot of families, but that's something within the sample size that was already tested. But the other ones that have these more subtle effect sizes or more subtle frequencies, you basically need tens of thousands of families in order to be able to discover them. But you only need a few thousand cases to be able to discover them with genome-wide association. So that basically tells you the regimes at which linkage analysis works versus association. So this is one is a low frequency, strong risk variant. And because it's a risk variant, it's easy to find families that have simply an increased prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease. But for a strong protective variant, even though the association is the same, you would never be able to find it in a linkage analysis because in a linkage analysis, you're basically selecting pedigrees where the disease of interest is actually overrepresented, not underrepresented. You don't have the power to select those families. And again, for ATG1601, this is a common associated variant. So this is quite easy to achieve significance with genome wide association studies, because even though the effect is subtle, only 40% compared to 300% for this one. The variant is very frequent, so you can actually associate it. 
But because the odds ratio is so small, linkage does not give you power to, to, to discover. All right, who's with me so far? You guys are following? Awesome. Um, good. So the other concept to, to recognize is that as you combine multiple studies, you can discover odds ratios that are smaller and smaller and smaller, more and more subtle. So here, this is a you know, 0.2 increase and a 0.3 increase and a 0.5 increase or 50% increase. And by combining all three published studies, you can basically reap the power of an 800 sample GWAS. And again, nearly all progress of GWAS has been the result of multiple uh, studies being combined in a meta-analysis. And that has led to this uh, threshold, this inflection point that you see over and over again in multiple uh, traits. So the first studies yielded almost no loci for many years. And then suddenly you turn the tide and you discover dozens of loci suddenly. The same thing was found in um, schizophrenia. So you could basically see here that there's absolutely no loci that are genome-wide significant, you know, only less than a handful. And then suddenly you go from less than five to, you know, um, dozens to now hundreds of loci. And that's simply a function of increased sample size. And that's something that has transformed the field of genetics. Basically, this uh, conviction that if you keep testing, if you keep finding uh, more individuals, more and more and more cases, eventually you will have a lot of additional signal. You can see here, no loci with 3,500 cases, five loci with 10,000 cases, and 62 loci with 35,000 cases, and now 265 loci with 65,000 cases. And then that same inflection point is found in nearly every complex trait. The same story was found for type 1 diabetes, for type 2 diabetes, for serum cholesterol levels, for every common chronic disease. And the reason is that these traits are heritable and they have simply a large number of small effect sites. So the genetic architecture of every one of those um, gives you some insights as to how many lows that you would need to go and discover them. So for height, it was on the order of 5,000 individuals as you start increasing, you know, twofold, threefold, ninefold, suddenly you have discovery. For Crohn's, the scaling factor is 1,000. For schizophrenia, it's 3,000. So you can see here the polygenicity is highest for height and then lower for schizophrenia and lowest for Crohn's disease. So that basically showed the world that schizophrenia is a heritable, a medical disorder. It's not just you know, some weird environmental influence and that the genetic architecture was similar to non-brain diseases and traits with many genes enabling recognition of key pathways and processes. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. The fact that as you start looking at these dozens of loci, you see that multiple voltage-gated calcium channels are in fact repeatedly hit, that there's proteins interacting with fragile X, there's proteins involved in neuron organization and postsynaptic density in the dritic spine uh, heads. And there's enhancers that are acting in brain, in the angular gyrus, in the inferior temporal lobe and immune enhancers and so on and so forth. So that's where GWAS is now. You basically, uh, in 2011, you had already outpaced uh, you know, any kind of expectation. And in 2018, you have 70,000 uh, genome-wide association studies. And today we have more than 120,000 genome-wide association studies uh, that are, that are genome-wide association, genome-wide significant loci. And you can see here the huge diversity of traits that they're associated with. So, we basically talked about Mendelian approaches for linkage through these genetic maps in family studies. We talked about complex traits and their association using polygenicity, using environment, uh, using uh, these contiguous, continuous traits. And we also looked at the basics of a genome-wide association study. So how to carry out QC, chi-square, multiple testing, replication. And we also looked at the different methods for fine mapping and how linkage relates with association and how to combine multiple studies.
So who feels that they've uh, learned stuff today? Hmm. Is there a limit to the number of samples needed for this type of analysis? That is, the number of genomic sequences for which having more sequences provides little return. Arez, that's an awesome question. And the answer is, we haven't found that limit yet. And um, we're going to talk about that a little bit in the context of systems genomics, the fourth lecture in this module. But this concept of moving from polygenic to omnigenic and sort of finding core pathways that are truly directly linked to the disease and then a set of auxiliary pathways that are sort of bringing in information from many, many other places that are simply touching and modulating these core pathways is where the field is at right now. The more you look, the more you discover, but at some point the signal gets diluted out from the central pathways to more peripheral pathways. So that's sort of perhaps the end, but I don't think that there's any place where we're gonna stop discovering additional loci with tiny effects. Okay, so uh, yeah, 50, 50, 7, 0, 0. All right, so let's now switch to interpretation. How do we go from a genetic locus to the mechanism through which it works? How do we do that for individual loci? And how do we do that for global signals? So we're gonna look at different tools and then we're gonna look at some case studies, including the roadmap genomics paper, this EPIMAP paper and this FTO paper, all of which I've had the privilege of being a part of. So the goal of GWAS was to inform on the biology of disease in an actionable fashion. So how do we get there? There's a challenge of interpretation. Most associations do not identify specific genes and causal mutations. Instead, they're just pointers to small regions with causal influences on the disease. In order to develop and act on a therapeutic hypothesis, we must go much further. We have to figure out what gene is connected uh, to the disease, what biological processes are implicated, what is the cellular context in which it acts, and what are the functional alleles that perturb that process and promote or protect from the disease. The promise of genetics has been that by carrying out these Manhattan plots, that basically doing these genome-wide association studies, we would find genes. And that is you know, not exactly the case. We found genetic loci, but to find the actual genes is harder. And the reason for that is that when you open up these loci, such as this FTO locus here, which is the strongest genetic association with obesity, this association was discovered in 2007. And this is, you know, subsequent GWAS from 2010 that has many additional loci. But when you look at this association, which was discovered, you know, 10 years plus ago, you have 89 common variants none of which is actually perturbing of the protein. And that's the case for 90% of GWAS. In most of the cases, you're not gonna find a protein coding gene that's directly perturbed. This FTO locus was thought to be one of the easy ones because there's a single gene that underlies this locus. In many cases, you have a dozen genes that are all sitting here. And you're like, okay, gosh, which of these genes is it? This was thought to be an easy one because there are no other genes. So everybody basically went after the function of this FTO gene, but they all came back empty handed. They couldn't figure out how FTO acts on obesity. Don't get me wrong, FTO had a bunch of phenotypes, but none of them was actually obesity associated. And of course, deleting the whole region didn't necessarily point to this FTO gene because maybe this is a control element for some genes that are far, far away. And in fact, that's exactly what our group showed 10 years after this discovery, which showed that the true targets are actually sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away and 600,000 nucleotides away. So well, well past these linker equilibrium blocks. So the challenge of decipher deciphering mechanism is that for 90%, 93% of cases, the disease hits are actually non-coding Therefore, the target gene is not known. The causal variant is not known. The cell type of action is not known. The relevant pathways is not known and the mechanism is not known. So how do we overcome this? 
so that's what this course has been building up to guys. I mean, <laughs> you should like now say, wait a minute, we know how to do this. So we've talked about annotating non-coding regions of the genome, about linking enhancers to regulators and to target genes, about elucidating intermediate molecular and cellular phenotypes for these variation in order to be able to deliver the relevant cell types, the target genes, the causal variant, the upstream regulators, the relevant pathways, and these intermediate phenotypes. So based on all these papers, based on all this work, we basically wrote this review paper back in 2012, which eight years ago now is still very much relevant about interpreting non-coding genetic variation in complex traits and human disease. So what this paper did with uh, my former postdoc, Luke Ward, is look at the diversity of genetic architectures underlying human phenotypes. We talked about classic monogenic traits monogenic traits with multiple disease alleles, mono, monogenic traits with independent contributions. These are oligogenic, uh, multiple loci with independent contributions. These are oligogenic traits. And then large number of variants that jointly contribute weakly to an effect and variants regulating a molecular trait with unknown effect on organismal phenotype and variants causing no known molecular phenotype and no effect on organismal fitness, as well as private and somatic variants. So these are the types of variation and how do we understand them. And then we talked about these common genetic uh, variant associations. We talked about GWAS and you know the basis, the workhorse that we've talked about of cases versus controls, but also QTLs that we're gonna talk about in the next lecture of how you can discover not just genetic variation that impacts phenotype, but genetic variation here that impacts gene expression levels. So for example, here, if in blue, you're measuring the gene expression level for a bunch of genes nearby, and you see that all of the, all of the individuals carrying a T allele, for example, have higher expression for this gene nearby, you can basically say that there's an association between a genetic variant and a molecular intermediate trait, which we're gonna talk about very shortly and at great length in the next lecture. You can also look at genetic associations with allelic activity, where there's a genetic variant that controls whether the nearby uh, locus is actually going to be allelic or not. And you can also have molecular biomarkers for these organismal traits. So even if you don't have a genetic variant that is associated with case control, you can actually have an intermediate molecular phenotype. For example, the expression of this gene might actually be higher in the uh, controls and lower in the cases. That might mean that loss of expression causes the disease, or it might mean that if you have the disease, you, the, the disease causes that gene to lose its expression. Or maybe when you have the disease, your body fights the disease by turning off that gene. So there could be all kinds of correlations. When you take genetics out of the equation, you take the unidirectionality of that association. And then we talked about the mechanisms through which the non-coding variants can influence disease. They could influence uh, non-coding elements. They could, in, uh, through a splice uh, junction or a splicing enhancer, or through translation stability and localization, or through the trans-regulatory RNA, or through promoters, or through enhancers or even via synonymous mutations within protein coding sequences. And again, there's examples for each of those. And then we talked about the three types of evidence for GWAS interpretation. The first one is epigenomic information through enhancers, promoters, transcribed regions that are basically showing an enrichment across the genome that allows you to now find which of these variants are likely to be functional. The second one is using the motif disruptions for the individual variants. If this variant doesn't change the motif, but this variant does change the motif, you lose motif B here, you might say, aha, this variant is probably the causal one. And alternatively, you might find that uh, the, some variants are actually lying in evolutionarily conserved elements and disrupting nucleotides that evolution has been minutely preserving across millions of years, and others are not disrupting conserved elements, suggesting that this might actually be the causal one. And we're gonna talk about comparative genomics and mammalian constraint uh, in the next module. 
And then there's a lot of tools that have been built for using this. So um, Luke, uh, who's the author of this paper, developed Hapnoreg, but RegulumDB is another one. Ensemble has a lot of tools, and then there's uh, a lot of other uh, tools that have both disappeared since then, but also emerged uh, since then. And then the last component that we talked about was the systems level analysis, the fact that you can look at genes within the associated loci and then find specific enrichments in biological processes that allows you to then prioritize a subset of uh, genes and loci that are also in those processes and boost their significance. You could also look at what is the uh, what are the annotations that are showing the highest enrichment and then use those as empirical priors to then go in and prioritize specific annotations. And then uh, look for specific loci that exhibit high allelic heterogeneity, which are implicated in the disease or implicating causal variants through whole genome uh, sequencing. And then various tools for actually carrying out this enrichment analysis. You can carry out gene set enrichment analysis uh, through the associated loci by basically ranking all of the genes nearby or look for concordance with EQTL results or enrichment in specific chromatin states or uh, both TF binding site and DNA hypersensitivity enrichment. So these are the basic tools that are at your disposal. And then I wanna highlight utilization of these tools through a series of papers that uh, you know, we and others have written. So the first one is this Roadmap Epigenomics Project and this ENCODE project that together basically looked at dozens of different tissues and their association and their uh, associated enhancers, promoters, transcribed regions, repressed regions, heterochromatic regions, and active regions. So through this chromatin state analysis that we talked about in the epigenomics lecture and through the specific peaks of these uh, histone modification marks, as well as the specific accessible regions in high resolution through the inaccessibility, we've been able to map the set of regulatory elements that are active in every one of dozens of different tissues and cell types. So we've used those to map chromatin states across more than 100 different tissues and cell types to then group enhancers into modules of common function. And we talked about that in the epigenomics lecture to predict the upstream regulators of these modules and to also link enhancers to their downstream target genes through membership in modules that are correlated with each other or through direct correlation between the enhancer and the gene across different cell types. You can now use this information to start inferring the circuitry of GWAS loci. How? By basically asking what are the individual SNPs that are underlying this association? This is using this statistical fine mapping or this credible interval or this multi-ethnic study or other uh, approaches to infer the posterior inclusion probability of every SNP. You then can ask, what are the enhancers that those SNPs overlap? What are the cell types where SNP overlapping enhancers are enriched? What are the genes whose expression is correlated with these enhancers? And what are the upstream regulators whose motifs are enriched in these enhancers. So that gives you the components that we were looking for, for finding the target genes, for finding the cell type of action, for finding the causal nucleotides, and for finding even the upstream regulators. Who's with me so far? You guys are following? Awesome. So we basically built a series of tools for uh, doing this. So we're starting with any list of SNPs and then selecting a genome-wide association study and systematically mining ENCODE and roadmap epigenomics across hundreds of assays and dozens of cells and conservation and motifs and reporting significant overlaps, but also linking to information in browsers. Here's one of my favorite loci. So you can basically see here this association with uh, you know, adipose and mesenchymal stem cells in these enhancers that are active specifically there and you know this nearby gene PPAR gamma 
And this, in fact, suggests that the driver might actually not be the missense variant, but instead another variant that actually seems to be perturbing things in the correct orientation as opposed to the missense variant. But the more general methodology is that we're going to be identifying disease relevant cell types through the systematic overlap of these genetic loci that are associated with different disorders and that are enriched in specific annotations. So this method takes power from the fact that we don't have just a single GWAS, but we have dozens of genome-wide association studies. And for every one of those, we can look at what are all of the associated loci and what are all of the SNPs within these loci that are specifically associated with the disease. And if you do this with height, you find certain locations in the genomes are painted. If you look at type one diabetes, you find different locations in the genome. If you look at blood pressure, yet another set of locations. If you look at cholesterol, yet another set of locations. So every single genetic trait paints a different subset of the genome. And you can now come up with a different set of colors and ask which of those overlap enhancers that are active in stem cells or enhancers that are active in immune uh, cells, or enhancers that are active in heart, or enhancers that are active in liver. And that allows you to now infer a map between genetic traits and the tissues where these traits might be acting. So we're identifying all of the associated regions at some p-value threshold, and this could be five times 10 to the minus eight, or this could be a sub-threshold cutoff for example, at 10 to minus four, 10 to minus three. And then considering all of the SNPs in the credible interval, say R squared greater than 0.8, and then evaluating the overlap with tissue specific enhancers and keeping the tissues that show significant enrichment. And then you repeat for all traits and all cell types. And what you end up with is something like this. That basically tells you that if I look at the genetic variants associated with height, I find that they're enriched in enhancers active in embryonic stem cells. Genetic variants associated with immune functions are enriched in T cells and B cells. Genetic variants associated with heart repolarization or blood pressure are enriched in enhancers active in the left ventricle. We're not talking about genes here. We're talking about enhancers. We haven't even looked at genes. This is directly looking at the non-coding genome. That basically says that these genetic variants are specifically perturbing non-coding gene regulatory elements active in left ventricle. If you look at fasting glucose related traits, extremely specific to type two diabetes, for example, you see here the strongest enrichment is associated with pancreatic islets. And these are those specific beta cells that are killed by the T cells in the case of type two, uh, type one diabetes. And in the case of type two diabetes, these are the ones that are saturating and are no longer able to control insulin correctly. If you look at cholesterol associated genetic variants, they localize in enhancers active in the liver. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, they localize in enhanced the genetic association variants, they localize in enhancers active in both immune and inflammatory cells, as you would expect from the name, but also in digestive tissues, again, as you would expect by the name, suggesting that genetic variants both in immune and in digestive components are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And one of the surprises at the time that we wrote this paper was that Alzheimer's disease was not associated with brain at all. We would expect that Alzheimer's acts specifically in brain, but this was not the case. What we found instead was that Alzheimer's was super mega enriched for CD14 plus immune cells. These are monocytes. These are both the circulating macrophages in the blood, but also the resident microglia in the brain, suggesting that in fact, only a subset of brain cells, a tiny minority of brain cells that are playing immune functions are in fact driving this association with Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, we published a companion paper also in Nature that basically looked at these conserved epigenomic signals in mice and humans revealing the immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. So what we basically found is that if you look at mice, the changes that are happening in immune, in immune fun functions are in fact happening much earlier 
then the changes that are happening in neuronal function suggesting that in fact, genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's might actually first act through the microglia and only then act through the rest of the brain. And we've now repeated this analysis by actually sorting cells and showing that indeed this is localizing specifically in the microglia, the resident immune cells of the brain. And again, we saw that we could now paint a map of what are the genetic loci, the genetic traits, and which tissues were their uh, loci enriching in. You can see here Alzheimer's clusters with the immune traits, surprisingly, whereas, you know, um, attention deficit disorder and other, you know, brain associated traits do cluster, cognitive traits do cluster with brain and so on and so forth. And this was then, this is now, uh, we've basically scaled this to 800 plus uh, tissues by including many additional consortia. And that has basically led to direct associations with 245 GWAS uh, traits, and then tree-based enrichments across 540 different GWAS traits. And you can see here just the same picture, but now with tiny, tiny little dots with you know, 30,000 loci that are specifically sitting within these enriched annotations. So that allows us to now start looking at the dissection of these traits by going down the list of enriched tissues and then asking which loci within these traits are in fact overlapping enhancers within these enriched tissues. And can we use these enhancer gene correlations that we saw in the previous lecture to basically start predicting the target genes of these upstream uh, regulatory elements. So you can see here the association, there's a lead SNP here, which is higher than all the other ones. And that lead SNP localizes specifically in these enhancers. So this is a breast cancer GWAS, and this actually localizes an enhancer that is active specifically in the breast epithelium and is linked specifically to this NTN4 target gene, which is associated with prognosis and metastasis of breast cancer. So this is allowing us to now go into these genetic loci for 30,000 different pictures and sort of paint this. And we have a website where you can actually go and do this systematically. Here's another example with a genetic association with schizophrenia. And you can see here, instead of the nice tight correlation that we had in a localization with only you know, one SNP, you now have dozens of SNPs that are weakly associated. And all of those SNPs are in fact lying in these enhancers, which are all together linked to this common target gene, which is this uh, calcium signaling uh, transport uh, gene. So which is you know, specifically associated with schizophrenia. We also are able to now go and look at much more complex traits. So this is uh, looking at how individual traits are in fact localizing in individual tissues and how those tissues are in fact associated with, a, how these traits are associated with a single tissue or multiple tissues. So if you see a circle that's entirely green, that means that the only enrichments are found in these immune cells. But if you see a circle that has multiple components, that basically means that it's associated with multiple tissues. And you can see here, there's a lot of single tissue traits, for example, educational attainment, schizophrenia, you know, you have cholesterol associated with liver, you have filtration associated with kidney, uh, you have cardiac traits uh, associated with heart, you have immune traits associated with immune cells, and you also have AD associated Alzheimer's associated with immune cells. So these are the unifactorial traits that we saw in this picture, which were associated primarily with one tissue. But then you have this group of traits here, which are polyfactorial and multifactorial. So these traits are associated, are enriched in many, many, many different tissues. So what's going on here? Well, these traits are actually sitting in between these dense maps and suggesting that they're implicating many different tissues. And if you look at some of those traits, you basically see that, for example, QT interval, 
is extremely unifactorial, hard, 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 hard. Educational attainment, extremely unifactorial, brain. And the only one that's not directly brain is actually bipolar neurons uh, derived from embryonic stem cells. Uh, another one, Alzheimer's disease, you see brain, but also immune cells, waist to hip ratio, a small number, health span, an increasingly large number. And then the largest by far is coronary artery disease. And that has 19 different enrichments in 19 different categories. So we can now use these to start partitioning these enrichments into specific functions. And what you see is that, for example, both liver and coronary artery are tissues that are enriched for coronary artery disease, um, genetic variants. So, but, but if you partition, if you partition the loci associated with coronary artery disease that lie within liver enhancers, you see enrichments for very different functional processes than the CAD associated loci that lie within heart tissue enhancers, which are enriched in very different processes. And the same thing happens with the comorbidity patterns. If you basically look at what are the traits that are comorbid with loci with CAD in loci that are associated with liver that are showing co-associations. You basically see a, a, you know, a different set of traits for different sets of tissues and different sets of functional categories. So that allows us to now start partitioning these polyfactorial traits into their components. So here's uh, this CAD analysis in more detail. You can basically go down the list of loci and say, well, which ones are enriched in liver? Which ones are enriched in coronary artery? And so on and so forth. And you can see here, this example is only enriched in liver and in liver. It only overlaps liver enhancers. And indeed, when you look at this example, there's only liver enhancers here, and it's linked to the PCSK9 gene, which is a well-established uh, gene underlying cholesterol that acts through the liver. By contrast, if you see this uh, gene EDNRA, you basically see that it only overlaps coronary artery here and heart and atrium here. And indeed you see this association that is mediated through multiple enhancers, both converging onto the same target gene, which acts in heart. But you can see also examples where both mechanisms appear to be acting. You see that both liver and you know heart uh, samples are found here. And indeed, you see that these associations implicate primarily liver, but also to some extent, some of them are linked to another gene here that appears to be acting in heart. So enabling us to now start dissecting these polygenic traits. So we built a lot of resources for systematically annotating GWAS and uh, exploring these associations. So we've developed a browser uh, for going through these links, going through these loci, going through these visualizations of uh, target genes. And I really um, you know, encourage you guys to, to just go and explore that. And it's gonna be very helpful for your projects. So in the remaining few minutes, I want to sort of touch a little bit on this FTO locus, which is sort of one of the first examples of complete dissection for a non-coding disease locus, where we identify the cell type, the causal SNP, the regulator, the target, and the process, and where we actually use genome editing to demonstrate the causality of that variant, namely uh, linking adipocyte browning uh, as drivers of obesity. And this is an awesome collaboration with Melina Klausenter and many others from my lab and from many other institutions. So the goal there was to apply these six goals to these specific locus. Namely, how do we establish the relevant tissue and cell type? How do we establish the downstream target genes? How do we establish the causal nucleotide variant among many that are in close association? How do we find the upstream regulators that control this variant? And how do we ultimately understand the cellular and the organismal phenotypes that result from the target genes? So as I mentioned earlier, this FTO locus has 89 common variants. 
and this is the strongest association with obesity and the regulatory role, the target gene and the tissue have been under great debate. This locus impacts only one gene, as you can see here, but many other genes are in the neighborhood, potentially causal, and many of these have been proposed through different studies. But in fact, what we found is that this gene here, IRX3, is the true target, as well as, I, sorry, IRX5, as well as IRX3, that are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away and 600,000 nucleotides away, and many, many LD blocks away, as you can see here. So, how do we do that? Well, we use all of these techniques that I showed you and we apply them systematically. First, to find the relevant tissue and cell type. We basically use the epigenomics roadmap, looking across the different tissues, and then looking specifically within enhancer regions that are, we're finding are the most associated with disease to, to recognize that there's this 12,000 nucleotide super enhancer that is active specifically in mesenchymal stem cells and these are the stem cells that give rise to both white adipocytes and beige adipocytes. White adipocytes are the ones that are storing lipids and beige adipocytes are the ones that are actually burning calories as heat through mitochondrial membrane depolarization. So we then ask, well, you know, is the RIC haplotype actually showing increased activity or decreased activity? And what we found is that the risk haplotype shows higher enhanced activity, suggesting a derepression in the risk individuals. That was the first step, finding out what is the tissue where it acts, and we found pre-adipocytes. The second step is looking at what are the target genes. And there's many ways to find target genes. One, we mentioned based on the correlation between enhancer activity and gene expression. The second one we also talked about, about the genetic correlation between a genetic variation and a change in gene expression nearby. And the third one we talked about in the epigenomics lectures as the folding of the genome in three dimensions. This high C or chromatin conformation capture that basically tells you if I chop up the bowl of noodles, what are the noodles that tend to reconnect with each other? And this locus here, FTO, had basically many reconnections with IRX5 and IRX3, suggesting that it forms long range interactions. So looking within this block of interactions, we basically found that exactly two genes within this large block showed an increase in expression for the risk carrying individuals looking at homozygous risk and homozygous non-risk individuals for this obesity associated locus, we found that the obesity risk individuals were in fact increasing the expression of IRX3 and IRX5, suggesting again, derepression of those two genes. So that is an example of a gain of function rather than a loss of function. And it also acted specifically in early adipocyte differentiation. The EQTL is no longer visible in whole adipose tissue. So that gives us the first one, the tissue where it acts, and the second one, the target genes through which it acts. What about finding the causal nucleotide? So again, we use this approach of looking at specifically which nucleotides intersect enhancer regions and which ones are evolutionarily conserved. Looking at the global enrichment, we found that there's many regulatory motifs involved in BMI that are enriched in the same target regulators, and that there's specific motif combinations that are disrupted by this T2C variant that disrupts this AT rich interacting domain motif by changing the T into a C. So what that told us is that this might actually be this evolutionarily conserved motif that gets disrupted might actually be the causal uh, variant. And indeed, if you looked at this uh, introduced RS1421085 SNP, this T2C alteration, you found that when you introduce that in a 10,000 nucleotide uh, construct or in a 1,000 nucleotide construct, you increase the activity of the reporter gene, but you lose that in a 100 base per construct, suggesting that it's a really large enhancer that needs to function together. So that gives us the tissue, the target genes, and the causal nucleotide. What about the upstream regulators? So we basically looked at what are the factors that are known to recognize this motif and which of these factors are in fact associated with increased expression in specifically adipose tissue. And indeed we found that IRIC5B was very highly expressed in both risk and non-risk individuals. 
Again, we don't expect the expression of the regulator to change. We only express the, the expect the activity of its target to change. So we went in and did a cis trans conditional analysis, changing the motif and changing the regulator to look at the interaction effects between the two. And we found that it's only when you lose both the motif and the regulator that it's only when you have both that you have an effect. But if you lose either one of them, you basically lose repression. So you require both for repression. But if you lose either one of them or both of them, then you have derepression. And same thing with the target genes. If you have both of them intact, both the cis and the trans, then you have repression. But if you lose either the cis or the trans, you have derepression. So that gives us the target genes, the upstream regulators, the tissue, and the causal nucleotide. The last question is the cellular and the organismal phenotypes. So how do we bridge that gap between genetic variation and disease by looking at this intermediate effect? And what we found is that IRX3 and IRX5 were in fact correlated with both mitochondrial function and with lipid activation. The lipid metabolism genes were positively correlated, suggesting that increased expression of IRX3 and IRX5 was in, associated with lipid metabolism, but decreased expression was associated with mitochondrial function. And that's where the cellular phenotypes helped us by showing that indeed the risk carrying individuals have fewer mitochondria, suggesting that perhaps they're not able to undergo thermogenesis and they have bigger adipocytes, suggesting that they're accumulating lipids. And indeed, carrying out these experiments specifically between risk and protective alleles in stimulated conditions or not, show this dramatic difference in mitochondrial thermogenesis, where the risk individuals were unable to thermogenize, whereas the uh, control individuals were able to thermogenize. So that gave us this supposition that perhaps this C2T alteration caused the shift between white adipocytes and beige adipocytes during the first three days of differentiation, leading to this shift from energy burning to energy storing. And indeed, we went in and tested this by carrying out specific interventions of knocking down RX3 and RX5, overexpressing RX3 and RX5, knocking down RIT5B and overexpressing it, and also using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing on the specific single nucleotide variant out of the 3.2 billion nucleotide variants in the genome, uh, nucleotides in the genome. And we found that in every single one of those cases, we would switch between lean and obese phenotypes like a switch. By knocking down or overexpressing the IRX3 or the RX5 gene, we basically saw that we could switch between lean and obese phenotypes dramatically. By changing the expression of IRX3 in mice, we saw that the mice were losing 50% of their body weight and they were becoming unable to gain weight on a high fat diet when normal mice gain weight. The IRX3 dominant negative mice in adipocytes were not able to gain weight. And they did not change their exercise. They did not change their appetite. They only changed their thermogenesis, their burning of calories. And lastly, we saw that editing that single nucleotide variant from T to C led to derepression of the gene mirroring the risk phenotype. And editing back from C to T showed repression again, restoring these you know, successful repression of IRX3 and IRX5. And indeed, editing that single nucleotide variant showed that you could change and restore thermogenesis in the risk individuals by taking primary adipocytes from risk carriers and changing them into non-risk carriers, you could restore the process of thermogenesis, establishing for the first time this complete link between a non-coding allele sitting in a super enhancer, acting in pre-adipocytes, targeting genes that are 600,000 and 1.2 million nucleotides away, finding the causal regulator and motif, this T2C alteration causing loss of this AT-rich interacting domain when you lose this AT-rich motif, 
and causing derepression of IRX3 and RX5, derepression of this enhancer, and then the change in the cellular and in the organismal phenotypes. So the story is important because it shows you how all of these tools that we've been learning about are actually fitting together in a single framework for systematically understanding the relevant tissues and cell types, target genes, causal nucleotides, upstream regulators, cellular and organismal phenotypes. And that's one of hundreds of loci. So we now need new tools for doing this systematically. And that's where we're gonna stop. So we talked about genetics, genome-wide association studies, and then interpretation. What are the tools? Case studies, looking at the global level, and then a case study looking at the single locus level. What I like to say, this is a whole paper about a single SNP in the human genome, a single bit of information. That's where I'll stop. And then uh, see you guys um, tomorrow, or actually on Thursday for the next lecture on the GWA series. Who feels that they've learned stuff today? Awesome. Thanks, Juno. <clears throat> awesome. Great. Thanks, everyone. This is lovely. So, zero, zero, zero.